Now you talk about terror I've been terrorized All my day Hammer All my day Chris Hedges. Welcome to Days of Revolt. In this segment, we're going to discuss resistance inside the prison system by black radicals who created, in essence, uh, the vast network of uh, solitary confinement cells known as management control units uh, to isolate them from the rest of the prison population so they would not teach revolution. Uh, and their presence saw the rise of numerous techniques, uh, including the infusion of SWAT teams, all sorts of psychological mechanisms to break people down, uh, to snuff out uh, a movement that the state uh, found to be deeply disruptive, especially in its internal colonies, as Malcolm X called them. Joining me in the studio are two revolutionaries who spent uh, tremendous amounts of time not only in prison but in solitary confinement. Uh, Ogeri Latulo, 28 years in prison, 22 of those years in isolation. And Eddie Conway, 44 years in prison uh, for a crime he did not commit, uh, seven years in isolation. Is that correct, Eddie? So you both went into the prison in the 1970s. What year exactly was it, Audrey? <clears throat> well, you know, the early 70s. Early 70s, and you? 1970 itself. 1970 itself. And this was a time when the state uh, was making war against radical leftist movements, not only uh, the groups you were in, Eddie was a member of the Black Panthers, Audrey was a member of the Black Liberation Army, but the American Indian Movement, the Puerto Rican Independence Movement, as well as even uh, white uh, anti-war radicals. And uh, just as they were attempting to break these movements outside prison walls, once you arrived inside prison walls, it became personal. Uh, they were going to break these movements by breaking you, and that's largely what solitary was about, to break you psychologically, to isolate you from the rest of the prison population so that you couldn't raise political consciousness uh, among younger prisoners who were coming into the system. Um, and we still have about 150 black radicals, uh, Sundiata Akoli, and others, Mumia Abu Jamal, who remained behind prison walls. Um, what were the techniques, let's start with you, Eddie, by which you were able to resist in this almost perfect totalitarian state? Well, I think initially, uh, my first seven years was spent in solitary confinement because you really had to fight back and you had to resist. Uh, and resisting could be something as simple as refusing to leave the dining room if you're not finished eating. And that was considered an act of uh, resistance, an uh, act of uh, a riotous, uh, and you were attacked for stuff like that. So uh, by the guards, by the guards, right? And so pretty much what we did was like every time they pushed, we had to push back, and it led to a lot of combat. It led to a lot of conflicts, and it led to a lot of segregation time. But at some point, they got exhausted, and they stopped attacking us. Oh, well, you had you were physically assaulted by a guard whose baton you took. And you were charged with not only assault, but theft, theft of the baton. Yes. And was the, that the incident where your jaw was broken? Or? Uh, uh, no, that wasn't, but there was another incident. Right. Yeah. You were pretty badly beat up. Yes. 
Yes, I've had my shoulder broken, my right. jaw broken, et cetera. I think that's yeah. something that many people outside the system don't understand, and that is uh, that just as our militarized police forces can carry out indiscriminate lethal force on the streets, they carry out indiscriminate beatings and very brutal beatings uh, within the prison system itself. And there was uh, an interesting article in the New York Times uh, recently where they uh, interviewed prisoners from the Clinton Correctional Facility uh, and in the immediate aftermath, there was, this is where we had the prison escape by Richard Madden, David Sweat, uh, and in the hours afterwards, prisoners were taken to uh, broom closets, uh, badly beaten, uh, plastic bags were put over their heads until they suffocated all of this while they were handcuffed. Other prisoners were slammed against walls, slammed against uh, uh, you know, bars themselves, heads banged into walls. Um, and this is kind of the currency within prisons where the goal is to make everyone obedient and everyone subservient. Um, and you, Ogery, spending 22 years in isolation, which is almost unfathomable, um, what were the mechanisms by which you retained your humanity and retained your ability to resist? Well, so I went to prison as a revolutionary. And as a revolutionary, I came to terms with the process of death and captivity. Plus, I always had a strong sense of self and purpose and had an ideology, right? And so that sustained me through the 22 years. When everybody else abandoned me, it was on me to come up with survival tactics, right? What were they? I would, uh, I, I, I created what I call a cell program. I would get up in the morning, I would read, write, exercise, you know, start working on my collages, right? And that was a big part of my survival, right? You know, creating collages, right, about political commentary, what, what's going on. This with is where I've seen them. It's where you would rip up newspapers and magazines and write political messages. <laughs> and all I had was magazines and glue, Elmer's glue. And, I, and then I would do a lot. I, I would do a lot, a lot of outside uh, interviews with people on a national, international level, right? You didn't wear a prison uniform. Yes, I did. There, what, wasn't there times when you were? Oh, 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 at, at one time, you, you could wear civilian clothing. No, but weren't you naked in the cells? From oh, yeah, well, at one time they put me in a, um, in, a in a mental health unit for That's six what days. Was, right. They held me incommunicado in the mental health unit for six days. They took all my clothing. Right. Left me standing next to a pole of uh, rainwater. And the rain outside would rain into the cell. And it was freezing cold, the light stayed on 24 hours a day. I was on the camera watch. No. Uh, Eddie, I know that you attempted to organize prisoners. Uh, maybe you can explain a little bit about that, what, what you did once you got into the prison system. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, let me just go step back one second, but I will answer that. Uh, I think their goal was was not the obedience and subservience. I think their goal was to dehumanize mm. every prisoner. Because you have a dehumanized prisoner, then you can control him and the environment. Uh, uh, one of the things that was happening was we were getting paid nine cents an hour. So I organized a United Labor Prison Union. Uh, and we demanded minimum wage, which at that time probably wasn't that much, four or five dollars an hour. But it was that effort that got the, the most reaction from the guards and the administration when prisoners decided that they were human beings and they deserved to be paid for their labor in spite of what the 13th Amendment says that says that, right. that we could be uh, subjected to slavery as prisoners. Uh, the reaction was 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 hostile and swift, and uh, eventually they locked us all up and shut the prison down and everything, because we wanted to be treated like human beings. So, and it was every place that we organized, we organized a library because we wanted to learn. We we pushed for control of a radio that we could talk to each other. Uh, everything we organized that would enhance our humanity, they attacked. The interesting dilemma we face at the moment is that because the mechanisms by which reform are made possible no longer work, that attempt to organize 
around the minimum wage issue is, I'm asking, I guess, but I suspect is the last weapon we have to break the back of mass incarceration where we in the United States hold 25% of the world's prison population and are 5% of the world's population because it is based on a system of neo-slavery. Prisons function like plantations and prisons would not be able to sustain themselves without the uh, highly undercompensated or even free labor. Uh, as you know, everything in the prison is virtually done by the prisoners, uh, from the barber shop to the cooking of the guards' foods to shining the one of the most highly paid jobs in the New Jersey prison system are the are the boot blacks, the people who shine the boots of the guards all day long. Um, and if they had to compensate at minimum wage, the system would collapse. And I'm wondering if that, in your estimation, is the primary mechanism now that we have to fight back against the mass, the system of mass incarceration in the United States, or are there are others. What do you think, Audrey? I think uh, <clears throat> well, we need to organize. That's, that's the only solution to the problem at this point. Inside and outside. Inside and outside. But organizing uh, around minimum wage? No, no, no. Organize against oppression. Because, like in, inside Chen State Prison, you don't have any jobs. Right. That's a supermax prison. Supermax, no. It's, just, it's a lockdown. Right. So you have to organize. That's, that's lockdown means 23 hours a day. Well, no, no but for prisoners in the management patrol unit. Right. It's 23 hours one day and you know, one day out. Right. So you have to organize. And that's to be done on a political level. And that's what the administrators are afraid of. What does that look like? What's that? I mean, what do you mean organized? Organized. You have to educate people about the reality of their oppression, for, of their oppression and the fact that we don't control the economics in our communities, right? And you have to give people hope, reason to struggle, something to struggle for. But right? isn't the only mechanism prisoners have by which they can fight back our work stoppages? Well, it's no work inside the Chinese state prisons, so we have to organize on another level. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm... Uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to have to disagree, uh, and I'm disagreeing because even in those supermax, ultramax, we have one here in Maryland, when, when you take away the prison labor, it stops working. In the, in the supermax, even though guys are behind those doors 23 hours, somebody's in the mess hall cooking the food. Right. Somebody's in the laundry washing the, the stuff. Somebody's in the commissary bagging up the, the stuff. Somebody mops the floor. Somebody brings the shower in, in, in Cumberland, Maryland, say for instance, you don't get out your cell, you go in a little telephone booth shower that rolls from cell to cell. Somebody rolls that shower right. down there. Somebody cleans it later on. Somebody picks up the trays. See, all of that stuff is work that we do that sometimes we don't recognize that if we stop doing all of that work, the prison system Well, they would also, isn't it true that in a supermax prison like Trenton, they'll bring in minimum security prisoners to do this work, they right? Do that. They, but they, still prisoners doing the work. They bring them in from Jones Farm. Right. They would, they, would bring the, they would cart the food in. Right. I mean, I'm assuming neither of you have faith in the system, the legislative system or the electoral system to bring about reform or not? No. No, no. way. So what is the, how do we destroy the system of mass incarceration? I mean, what is the mechanism? I'm, I'm definitely for prisoner labor unions. You, if you, and, and, and they have tried this in other states. If you organize labor unions and you demand minimum wage, it takes the money off of the prison right. industrial complex and they can no longer afford to incarcerate people like that. Right. They keep them long term like that because below the maximum levels in the medium and the minimum levels, we're making, uh, uh, furniture, we're making license tags, we're making clothes, we are... Uh, 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 McDonald's. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we're training dogs, we're doing all sorts of things oh, yeah, that's, that's creating the fish. wealth. Raising uh, fish farms. Yeah, raising fish farms. Oh, and right at on. the same time, we are supplying a way in which the guard forces make a living. Right. You know, so if you take the money away from that, then they will start letting people Well, out. if you look at the 2010 work stoppage in the Georgia state prison system, that cost the state of Georgia, which I think only lasted, if I remember correctly, nine days, mm -hmm. cost them millions of dollars. Um, yeah. And that I, goes back to what Audrey said. It, that's not going to work until you raise the consciousness of those inside the prison. Mm -hmm. um, but we have seen 
now decades of attempts on the part of the liberal establishment to institute reforms, both in terms of policing and in terms of mass incarceration, and the situation on the streets and inside the prisons have only gotten worse. What they do is like they grant reforms, and then when everything becomes like peaceful, they take the reforms back. I, I don't know what avenue we have left. I mean, the largest influx now of prisoners are women. Uh, you're seeing a larger and larger increase of poor white people coming into the prison system as they run out, in essence, of black bodies by which they can put in cages. 75,000 prisoners in this country live in isolation. Uh, Britain puts three to four people a year in isolation. Uh, and that kind of sophistication of control, and I know you went through it, Audrey. I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit about it, but you know, it's not just a matter of being in an isolated cell. It's a matter of being woken up in the middle of the night, extreme <clears throat> hot, extreme cold. I mean, uh, I know you've been, have spoken about being moved, you know. They used to wake up, wake us up every other morning with attack dogs. The security guards would be in riot gear. They was, we were stripped, we were, like, we were like back out the cell naked, and we had the attack dogs pulling on the least straining at our private parts. It was moves from one cell to another cell, and just repeat the same thing every day morning for months on end. Then another time, they had me on what is called a, a no contact status, whereas I couldn't do anything with a group or another individual, right? I would have to go to the yard by myself and my visits by myself, right? So I was a victim of what you call no touch torture. Right. So their goal was to break me psychologically. They placed me in a bloody cell after a prisoner had committed attempted suicide, took his blood and painted the cell red, right? And it was, just, it, was, it, was, it was never ending. But I think we should be clear that it often works. People do break down. Oh, people do break. But you see, but, but I, I, see, I study psychological warfare. I, stu I study the methods of breaking a person's mind. What's the brother Marion Eddie Griffin? He wrote a book called Breaking Men's Minds, right? So I, so I read that. Now, and I would circulate that amongst the prison, prisoners in the control unit so they could prepare themselves for, uh, to combat uh, this methods of uh, uh, no touch torture. We also have the phenomena of, which is not spoken about very much, prison executions, some of which never get reported at all. Mm -hmm. We just saw uh, at California State Prison Hugo Pino, who was part of the San Quentin Six, uh, knife to death. Was it in the prison yard, mm -hmm. Eddie? Um, but that's common. I mean, there, we just had a case in New Jersey where a uh, 28-year-old prisoner in Southwoods was, uh, it appears, beaten to death. Um, his body was returned to his family in Trenton, completely covered with contusions, broken bones, and they said he died of a heart attack. Um, that is a mechanism of control, uh, a cr creating a kind of climate of terror and fear, uh, along with rape. Um, an estimated 200,000 prisoners are raped in prison in the United States every year. Uh, and I think we should say that for many of these prisoners, this is daily rape. It's not a one-time incident because you get these particular figures who prey on, they call them the new fish, you know, these young kids who come into the prison. Uh, so much of the oppression that happens with inside American prison systems are either tolerated or even orchestrated by the guards, but are carried out by prisoners themselves. And perhaps you can, and then we haven't even spoken about informants, but maybe you can speak to that, Eddie, first. Well, uh, yes, I mean, there's certain benefits and privileges that a uh, certain class of prisoners get for carrying out the uh, wishes and the duties of the administration. Say, if you're hostile, they will, uh, uh, or say if you're organizing, you're a political organizer, they will direct the people that they have under their control, whether through the use of bringing in drugs to them or giving them some other benefits. They use those people to attack progressives, activists, revolutionaries, or just prison organizers that's organizing in an area in which they don't want that to happen. That happens a lot. Then also probably they use prisoners to do things that they want done and reward them by transferring them to other institutions with lesser security uh, and so on. So... Um, in the prison I teach in, they give yeah. them a cheeseburger and they say there are prisoners who will sell out 
another prisoner yeah. for a cheeseburger. Well, I've seen I've seen uh, uh, prisoners turn in their best friends uh, to go to the camp center. You know, or uh, sometimes friends that they've known for 10, 20 years, right. and they will snitch on them and form on them so that they can be transferred out, and their friend will end up in the super max or maximum security and end with a longer sentence. And I'm just going to close, Audrey, by asking you, and if there's time, Eddie, maybe you can comment as to whether they've been successful, whether, um, you know, that successful assault on radical movements outside prison walls, um, which has eradicated those militants that fought for significant social change, uh, has been successful inside prison walls as well. It, it has up until a point because I've seen people who came, came into the control unit strong leave weak. Mm. I've seen people who came in weak became strong. So a lot depends on the individual, on what, what composition, what, what his internal composition, psychologically. But in terms of a radical consciousness, do you think the prison system has been successful in essentially keeping the majority of the prison population in darkness? Yes, but mainly because like the, 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 the revolutionary element, they removed them from the general population. Right. So they don't have anybody to show them another way or give them that particular book they might need to read. Which is why you were 22 years in solitary. Exactly. He told me, I told him that I haven't done anything. He said, you could if you wanted to. Right. And that's the thought crime. Right. right. But, uh, but again, they, 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 isolation is effective in terms of breaking some people. Right. Well, it's right. also effective in, in quarantine, keeping radicals quarantined. No, definitely. <clears throat> but, you know, the other side of that, too, is that, that a, a lot of activists have been developed in prison as a result of them putting us in the prison system. A lot of mentors have been been developed and it's, it's the change in methodology of organizing, but organizing still go on. But the one thing that also shows a failure of prison is that the, the rebelliousness of the street organizations, there's a, a, a tremendous amount of street organization participation in the prison system and they are rebelling. And they're rebelling and they're resisting and they resist the guards as well as they resist society in general without direction in most cases, but still rebellion. I mean, the question we have to ask now is whether the state has pushed people on the streets and in the system, and prisoners are leaving prison now in debt, um, that they've just gone too far and that we may see uh, the rise of a new revolutionary movement born out of this repression uh, and hopefully informed by uh, your own revolutionary activity. I don't know if you see this coming or not. I, I see I see it coming within the walls of Trinity State Prison. I see it coming within the confines of Raleigh State Prison. Mm. Prisons are, don't have a choice. They said, what are we supposed to do? You took everything from us. You know, what, what, what's left? What to organize and rebel? But if that element is not there to feed them, it's, it's, it becomes more difficult. To feed them that political knowledge. You know, to organize them in terms of a, a phone strike or things of that nature, right? Right. And 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 we're definitely as in America on the a verge of a change. I mean, there's a new kind of sense of urgency to make changes, to challenge, uh, whether it is environmental or whether it's in, in integration. Uh, or whether it's uh, uh, the trans communities, or whether it's Black Lives Matter, or Occupy, or so on, there is a sense, or, or, or against the uh, national security state, there's a sense that things are wrong, and this is not working, and it's not working in the interest of the majority of the people, and people are starting to question that. And the questions eventually will lead to answers. They might not mm. learn from our example, but they'll learn from reading and studying and so on. Uh, but uh, And I think that's why you have such a surveillance state uh, developing, because it's not just now people on the ground but it's also uh, the greater uh, population of uh, white people also. Right, because they didn't stop with poor people of color. Yeah. Once they finished with them, um, they've turned on the poor working class and even the yeah. white middle class. They don't have any self-imposed limits. Yeah. Um, and so let's hope they follow your example. Thank you very much, and thank you for watching Days of Revolt.
had to eat out the watermelon patch. And you know they put me in a shack. 